Hi, everyone. Today we're going to talk about our lesson one of unit two, which is on the history of the atom. But before we do that, there are a couple of quick topics that I want to mention. Uh, they're related to the history of the atom, and they're also really important moving forward as some kind of foundational information. So the first one is this, the law of conservation of mass. As you can see, it says states that mass is neither created nor destroyed during ordinary chemical reactions or physical changes. So what this means is this. If you look at this diagram that's down here, you have a sealed off container. Inside of the container, this is an Erlenmeyer flask, by the way, that has a rubber stopper on the top. Inside of the container, there's a test tube. And inside of that test tube, there's a calcium chloride solution. Down here, sitting in the bottom of the Erlenmeyer flask, there's a solution of sodium sulfate. The entire thing, the entire system is sitting on top of a balance. And the purpose is so that you can see that the mass of all of this turns out to be 300.23 grams. Right now, because the solution is in the test tube, it's separated from the solution in the Erlenmeyer. In order to get the reaction to start, you can tilt the Erlenmeyer. That will spill the solution out from the test tube, allowing the two to mix together. Once you're done with that, you'll notice that a precipitate forms down here, indicating that a chemical reaction has occurred. Now, notice that the balance did not change. So the mass of that entire system remains as 300.23. This is really special because it proves that during a chemical reaction, the total amount of matter remains exactly the same. Now, sometimes this is difficult for us to see, especially in a reaction that would produce a gas, because if we were doing this gas in the lab, the, lab, the gas would escape from the setup, and then the mass would actually go down. And you might make an argument, oh, well, mass changes during a chemical reaction. But by doing it in this way, and having a completely sealed environment, completely sealed system, nothing coming in, nothing going out, you can see that mass is preserved. So the law of conservation of mass, again, states that mass is conserved, that it does not change as a result of a chemical reaction. If we look at this on an atomic level, what I wanted to show you here, this is a reaction for the combustion of methane. If you notice, we have one carbon on the left side here and four hydrogens. On the right side, we have one carbon, and we still have our four hydrogens. In terms of the number of oxygens, we have two O2s, or one, two, three, four atoms of oxygen. And on the right side, the product side, we still have one, two, three, four atoms of oxygen. Our second law, the law of definite proportions, states that a chemical compound contains the exact same proportions by mass of each element, regardless of the size of the sample or where you are getting that compound from. This one's a little bit easier to kind of wrap our minds around. So if we look, we have a picture of a water molecule found anywhere on Earth and a picture of a water molecule that might be present on Mars. Well, the water molecule makeup would be exactly the same. So it would be made up of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms, regardless of whether you were talking about a single droplet or a whole ocean of water. Same thing over here. A water molecule is a water molecule, regardless of where it's found, how much of it you found, or where it is, uh, or where it was located. And finally, our third law, the law of multiple proportions, states that if two elements form more than one compound, then the ratio of masses of the second element, which combined with a fixed mass of the first, and I'm going to show you a diagram of this, will be a ratio of small whole numbers. So if we take a look at this, our fixed mass is nitrogen in this example. So here we have a nitrogen atom combining with an oxygen atom to form this molecule, nitrogen monoxide. We can also have a nitrogen atom combined with two oxygen atoms and form nitrogen dioxide. The purpose of this is saying that atoms can form with different ratios, but they're always whole number ratios. So you're not gonna get a quarter of an oxygen or three quarters of a nitrogen atom. They combine in small whole number ratios. Okay, so for the next part here, we are gonna move on and talk about John Dalton and Dalton's atomic theory. 
this is really what propelled us from kind of a, an idea of what an atom was to really some scientific experimentation and, and some solid evidence moving towards what we know and understand today as our atom. So he came up with these five ideas, or he called them five postulates about what was true of an atom. And we're gonna find out actually that much of that that he stated way back in 18, kind of around 1810-ish, much of what he stated back in 1810 is still true today. So the first one, all matter is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. This is just a picture of a gold uh, brick here. Um, but basically what I'm trying to say is that all of the atoms that are in here are exactly the same. They're extremely small and atoms are kind of the building blocks of much larger elements. Dalton's next postulate was that atoms of a given, given element are identical in size, mass, and other properties, and atoms of different elements differ in size, mass, and other properties. So if you were in the classroom, I could pass around samples of carbon or silver atoms, and you would see that even though they might look similar, obviously they're different in color, their texture would be different, their mass would be different from each other. So that part is the same, but within a single atom, all of those atoms essentially look the same. So all of the carbon atoms look the same as other carbon atoms and all of the silver atoms look the same as other silver atoms. We're gonna to come to find out that this didn't exactly hold true or at least not all of it, um, but it's still pretty remarkable considering this was over 200 years ago. Dalton's third postulate was that atoms cannot be subdivided, created, or destroyed. So again, this Parts of this have changed uh, since then, so we now know this to be not, not quite as accurate. Dalton's fourth postulate states that atoms of different elements combine in small whole number ratios to form chemical compounds. This is very similar to what we just saw earlier in the law of multiple proportions. So if you notice, we have a molecule of hydrogen, in fact, two molecules of hydrogen, combining with a molecule of oxygen, forming two molecules of water. Finally, Dalton's fifth postulate states that in chemical reactions, atoms are combined, separated, or rearranged. So in this case, we have a methane molecule reacting with two oxygens to form carbon dioxide and two water molecules. And you can see the breakdown for that here. All of the atoms are the same. They're just broken apart and put back together in a different way. Chemical reactions, uh, maintain the same number of atoms of each type on the reactant and product sides. So a few things have changed since 1805 to 1810. And the first thing that's changed is we now know that a given element can have atoms with different masses. We're going to come to learn that that is called an isotope. So two atoms that have different numbers of neutrons, they would end up with different masses. Very similar in properties most of the time, but they can actually have different masses. And number three out of the five, atoms are in fact divisible into smaller particles and we can create and destroy atoms. And we now know that because that's how we're discovering our new atoms. We're actually taking existing atoms, kind of colliding them together. What I find really remarkable is all of the things that have not changed. So someone back in 1810 thought up these five ideas and really, to some extent, four out of the five still remain true. So if we look, all matter is composed of atoms, that is still true today. Atoms of one element differ in properties from atoms of another element, that is still true today. Atoms combine in small whole number ratios to form chemical compounds, again, still true today. And finally, in a chemical reaction, atoms are combined, separated, or rearranged. And we now know that's also true today. Pretty remarkable. Okay, we've come to the end of the first half of the history of an atom. What I would like you to do now is this Ed Puzzle activity that you can find in the Lesson 1 folder on Schoology. When you've completed the Ed Puzzle, please move on to Lesson 1B, the second part of our History of an Atom lesson.